Are we set? Brother? Okay. Nehemiah 4. Now, we've been working our way through uh, Nehemiah. Great book. Great book. I mean, here they, they're coming back. And Nehemiah heard the report that uh, the city, the holy city was in ruins. Uh, he went immediately to prayer and fasting and then stood before the king. And after making his request to the God of heaven, he made his request to the king on the throne and uh, he made his preparations and his plans and he returned and he called the people together in the uh, second chapter and in the third chapter we saw them rebuilding together and we talked about the practicality that that to to build a life or to rebuild a life to build a church or to rebuild a church it's got to be done together it's not a one-man show it's not a lone ranger or a lone wolf christianity the Lord has candlesticks and he lights candles and puts them in a candlestick where they work and they labor together. It's so important for building together. And we saw the beauty of it last week. And, and uh, we saw also how there were gorgeous portraits uh, in, in the entire Christian life and in the entire history of the church as we looked at the spiritual keys to all those gates and I think the notes are still up here if anybody wants them you can get them and we looked at the how each gate represented something and the work that God's done down through the centuries and in the work he does uh, through the years of an individual's life well in the fourth chapter uh, here they are working at the end of the third chapter and uh, the fourth chapter begins but it came to pass and they're all rebuilding together, that when Sanballat heard that we builded the wall, he was wroth and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. And he spake before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, What do these feeble Jews? Will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of the rubbish which are burned now Tobiah the Ammonite was by him and he said even that which they build if a fox go up he shall even break down their stone wall and what we're going to see here is uh, opposition no sooner than God begins to work the opposer Satan and his minions show up and what this chapter is going to show us is not over not only the opposition is going to show us how to overcome opposition as we read through this chapter because we can be overcomers when we build together with the Lord we don't have to let opposition stop us or stop the work of the Lord so I was looking at the brother Butler's work and he he's very good at the uh, simplicity of working through this chapter so I'm going to use a lot of his notes here because they're very good on a practical manner now the opposition to the building and the rebuilding back then we're going to find out is not just small opposition it's big opposition it's strong opposition it's uh, many people uniting together it's great opposition uh, the, the, the previous chapter where they're doing all this work didn't make any mention of it but what you want to understand is that opposition began quite quickly as soon as the plans were made as soon as the people were assembled as soon as they picked up the first couple of stones and began to do their work the opposers began right away it's not like they had a whole chapter where they could rebuild the they built in the face of opposition they built at the same time opposition was going on it's not like they built and then the opposition came later and so we're going to understand and, and when god is doing his work opposition is going to step in right away you're going to be taking your first steps for the Lord and right away there's going to be someone to try and stop you or trip you up. But this, I want to show you how God wants to show you how you can win these things. Now, uh, we're going to see that this opposition is rooted in the contempt and the hatred of the enemies of God's people. They have hatred in their heart. You know, they talk, they talk today about... Uh, uh, hate speech laws and and criminals that uh, commit things in hatred and and crimes of hate well the real hate is the hatred of God's work that's true hate we're talking with some people today and uh, about 
the God, and, and they had a, a notion that God is one-sided. And I said, well, God is balanced, and he has love, but he does hate evil. Ye that love the Lord, we're supposed to hate evil. And, and the evil hates us. And one is a good hate, and one is a bad hate. And one is a good work, and one is a bad work. And so what we're going to see is there's contempt in this. Uh, how quick did the contempt come? Verse 1, it came to pass when Sanballat heard. The minute he heard there's someone that wants to do something for God, immediately he wants to work. The devil, it doesn't take long. His, his men are ready to get into the battle immediately. The minute you want to begin to make any progress in your Christian life, particularly your progress in the Christian life of working together toward the building of the church and the family that God has given you to. He's given you a family. He's given you a church family. The minute you want to begin that work, there's going to be a rapid hatred and opposition and contempt that's going to come your way. I remember uh, hearing uh, uh, Pastor Scott Strobel up in uh, Lockport and uh, when he was, he, he thought he wanted to serve God, didn't know how, thought he'd be a, a priest, uh, went to talk to the seminary with some of the priests. When he saw all the alcohol being brought there, he thought this doesn't seem right. And he searched around and he met a friend that went to a, an independent Baptist church where there was a preacher that one midweek service showed him from the Bible how you can have a relationship with God. And he got that relationship with God. And no sooner he got home to tell his family that, you know, I'm born again and I have a relationship with God. What do you think? You're going to be a preacher or a pastor? Instantly, the opposition came to the call that God had on his life. No sooner he got the words out of his mouth. The rapidity of the opposition is fast and full of contempt. Uh, not only were they rapid in their contempt, it says in verse 1, when he heard that we builded the wall, Sanballat was wroth. There's anger. There's rage. Um, you know, you can tell a person when you talk to him, what is it that makes him happy and what makes him mad? You can begin to read the character. If, if you're angry at the work of God, you've got the wrong heart. You've got the wrong conscience. You've got the wrong character. This man, Sam Ballad, is angry at God's work. By the way, if you're angry at the work of God, you know deep down you're angry at God. Because God's the one behind the work. He's the one calling the people to the work. He's the one initiating the work. He's the one in the work. And here he is. He's, he's angry at God's work. What he's saying is he's angry at God. No matter what religion he professes, oh, I believe in God. I know God. If you're angry at the work God's doing, you're angry at God himself. That's who you're fighting. You're fighting God. And, and this is Mark a very poor character. Um, this is not the first time, by the way, that... Uh, Sam Ballot and his friends were angry at the work going on. You go back to chapter 2 and verse 9. When, when Nehemiah was just beginning to make his preparation, his plan, before he had picked up the, the, the first stone or before he had begun to clear out the first area of land, it says in 2.19, when Sam Ballot the Horonite and Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite, and Geshem the Arabian heard, they laughed us to scorn and despised us. So not only is the, the uh, opposition rapid, not only is there anger, wrath, and rage in it, it's repetitive. They never quit. Uh, you know, the, the same guy that's angry at you once, you're going to go away, you're going to continue serving God, you're going to come back, he's going to come again and again and again. When's this opposition going to quit? Well, one day when the Lord uh, delivers us from it. It's, 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 it's full of rage, it's rapid, and it's repetitive. It's going to keep coming. You're going to have to learn to stand. You might fall once, you might fall twice, but a just man, no matter how many times he falls, he rises up again and takes a stand again. And that's what he learns. You don't stay down. You never stay down. When you stay down, it's a sign of quitting. And if you're a quitter, you won't overcome. You won't win. You've got to get up. It's going to be repetitive opposition. You've got, to rep, you've got to repeatedly get up and stand again and take it and stand for it. 
uh, the plans were mocked. The progress is mocked. The enemy is persistent. That's what he wants to show you here. Uh, verse uh, 2. Look at the realm of this uh, hatred that he has. Uh, Samballat spake before his brethren, the army of uh, Samaria. And, and he said, now, now first off, he's got his brethren. He's got the army of Samaria. So, well, there's no more Samaritans today. Th there is no army today. Well, when you go back to that particular uh, historical setting, Samballat and Tobiah and those folks had been living in the land before these Jews had returned. And what happens, they had become the, uh, the governmental officials in the land. And the realm of opposition to truth is unfortunately the government where Satan's seat is. The government hates the Bible. It's sad. Uh, now, now, most of the governments of the world, we've known this for years. And you go through the, the history of heathen governments, and they've always been the haters of God and God's work and God's word. And, and of course, back in the Jewish times, you had, um, you had the Philistines, and you had the Ammonites, and, and you had all these outlying uh, people, the, the ones up north, the Phoenicians, all these people that hated God's work and hated God's work. We expect the heathen to hate the work of God. Now, we're a strange uh, situation because we're Americans and we're born into this one nation. I know a long, long time ago there was God chose a nation called Is Israel. But in the history of mankind, there's only been one nation that tried to choose the God of the Bible as its God. That's America. And when it started out, you had a bunch of Bible believers coming here and saying, we want God of Israel to be our God. We want Jesus Christ to be our Lord. As a matter of fact, when you go to some of the early charters in America, the charters of the states, and you read through them, you couldn't stand for office unless you were a member, unless you would confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you were a member of a, a Protestant church, because at that time, that's what they knew, a Presbyterian church, an Episcopal church, an Anglican church, a Lutheran church. If you weren't a member of a church like that, you couldn't even be part of the government. And to be a member of a church like that, those were churches that had the Bible and held that up as the authority of God's Word. It wasn't a Catholic church that had a catechism and traditions. These were Protestant churches that just held up the Bible. Solo Scriptura. And that's how America was formed. It was a nation that, that tried to choose God as its Lord. Of course, we know what's happened in the history. Just like Paul warned, evil men will creep in unawares. And men began to creep in and change the laws. And well, You know, anybody should be able to be a government official. And little by little, men who were not Christians worked their way into government. And today it's the government. It's the army of Samaria. It's Sanballat and his people. The, the Horonites is what they are. The whores that work late at night in Washington, D.C., writing these laws that we don't know about, that are the army against the, the work of Jesus Christ. Uh, just today, you faced it downtown. Uh, my son went downtown to preach with some people, and now come the police. Oh, you can't preach down here. Why not? Why not? There's a First Amendment. When they did it in 1776, the First Amendment was that you should be able to... Well, it, it bothers people. And they didn't want, and so they eventually had to leave and weren't able to preach today. Now, I'm going to go with Pastor L. We're going to go talk to the city attorney of Buffalo. I want to talk to the city attorney of Amherst. We're going to go talk to the city attorney of Tonawanda and try and explain what our rights are. We're going to bring some literature with us that we have from a legal organization to explain that the First Amendment, this is how the nation was founded, and get a space for that preaching without dealing with that interference. But the region of the contempt, the realm of contempt, is the governments of this world. Uh, like Satan said to Jesus, the kingdoms of the world are mine right now. And so the region of the contempt is in the government officials. Uh, it, it's, it's very sad, but evil seems to gain the support of government. Every time some new sin comes down the line, eventually the government condones it. The killing of babies. The, the ease of divorce and liberal no-fault divorce laws so that we can break up families. Uh, the, as the government is always giving place to some new sin, now the marriage of 
a man and man and woman and woman and sodomite marriage, which is an abomination in the sight of the Lord. And government is always willing to give place to that. The sand ballots and the Tobias are always willing to, they call that progress, but it's progress toward the pit of hell as they're walking away from God. And the realm of this, that's exactly where the realm is, the policy of evil, um, the, the permission. It's, it's permissible to indoctrinate and propagate evil in government settings like public schools. You heard what just happened this past week in California? What happened in California this past week is a bunch of uh, parents, the kids came home from kindergarten and they had just given a session to the kindergartners on changing their sex and becoming transgender. And a little girl came home and she was crying at the thought that somehow she could become a little boy. When the parents found out, they went down to the school and the school said, this is a new policy we have. Well, they said, well, we want our children to opt out. There's no opt out on this. This is mandatory for all the kindergartners and first graders. And, and you see how the permission for the indoctrination and the propagation of evil is all throughout the public government, sand ballot, army of Samaritans. However, let's say we'd like to do some Bible studies with kindergartners and see how that flies. What, will you build? Will you feeble Christians try and build the wall of truth around your children? And they're going to oppose it. So we see the realm of this contempt. We see the, the, the reasoning of the contempt goes like this in verse 2. Um, the army of Samaritan, listen to what he says. What do these feeble Jews the first thing in their reasoning is, you're feeble. You're simple. You're backwards. What, what kind of a mind, what kind of strength do you have? In other words, they're mocking the strength and the resilience of the people of God. We're stronger than you. You're weaker than we are. And that's true. God hath not chose the mighty. He's chosen the weak things of this world, but to manifest his strength. It may be true. That standing one to one against the Samaritan army, we can't stand any more than one to one. David couldn't stand against Goliath, but we have one on our side. And the overcoming of this opposition is going to be relying on the strength and the arm of the Lord. But you can see the reasoning that they have. What do these feeble Christians? These, these Christians that believe this old book, these Christians that, that couldn't get accepted into law school or professional school, these average, simple Christians, that's exactly what God calls in the simplicity of Christ, are the simple ones. And the first things they do is they mock the fitness of the workers. You know what it shows on their side is pride. It's revealing the pride of the mockers. The, the character is one of haughtiness and superiority, and pride. Now we know God resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. It's exactly those that are contrite and of a broken spirit and of a feeble nature that are the ones that God's going to work with, and He's going to use them to build. And in the end, they're going to win, and they're going to overcome. But we see the way this works. They mock the fitness of the workers. The next thing they mock, uh, let's see, what do these feeble Jews, will they fortify themselves? Are they going to grow in strength and grow in number? In other words, there's not too many of them. There, there, there aren't that many. What can they possibly do? What can a small church like Calvary Bible do in Tonawanda? What do these feeble Christians over on Delaware Street? What, what do that little tiny group at the end of Bucyrus? There's so few of them. They're so weak. Well, if we build together, we can do great things with the Lord. Despite the apparent, uh, the, the fact that we're outnumbered and we're outsized and we may look feeble and, and we may not be able to fortify ourselves, but with the strength of the Lord, we can do all things through Christ. Uh, and then the next thing uh, he says, will they sacrifice? I'm, I'm doubting their fitness. I'm doubting their fewness. I'm doubting, I'm doubting their faith. Will they sacrifice? You know, to build, take sacrifice. Okay. To get saved doesn't take sacrifice. To be a believer, all you got to do is believe. To be a Christian, all you got to do is believe. By grace, you are saved through faith. God's not asking anything of you to get saved. You want to be a disciple? You want to rebuild the wall? You want to do something for God? You got to sacrifice. You got to put your hand to the plow. You can't look back. 
You've got to overlook the cares and the, and the riches of this world. And you've got to deny yourself and press forward. Will they sacrifice? That's a question the enemy always have is that he's going to give up. He's not going to, he's not going to press through the sacrifice. Sadly, the enemy's right in a lot of cases. But the ones that finally rebuild the wall, yes, they do fortify themselves in the Lord, even though there's few of them. And yes, they are fit in the Lord. And yes, they will sacrifice. But that's the few. But the Lord's going to win the victory with few, just like he did with Gideon's small army of 300 against 120,000. Uh, will, will, will they sacrifice? Another thing he wants to know, he says, um, will they make an end in a day? I think you can apply this two ways. One, are they expecting you to do it overnight? Because they're not going to be able to do it overnight. And that's, some, that's a lesson we have to learn. The second thing is, I think he's mocking those people when, when Nehemiah got them together and there had been the preaching of the prophets and, the, and their hearts was turned to the Lord and they, they all gathered together with a shout and an hallelujah chorus and they jumped into it with a fervency and an excitement and an enthusiasm that looked like they're going to do it in one day. And, and that's one of the things that's needed is some fervency and some enthusiasm in God's work. I mean, to do the work of the Lord should be the joy of your salvation. Not the drudgery of your salvation. And it should be done in such a way that people see it and go, wow, they're, they're, gonna, they're, they're so excited. They're going to finish this in one day. Look at the fervency and the excitement and the enthusiasm they have. Now, now how often do you see that? But, but really, rebuilding together, there needs to be some fervency in it. And that's what they're doubting right there. And then they also say... Uh, Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of the rubbish which are burned? They're not only doubting the fitness of the workers, the, the fewness and the, the number of the workers, the faith of the workers, the fervency of the workers. They're doubting the actual stuff, the material, the fabric that they're using. Now, that is a truism that I've observed in most of the great churches. Some of the great churches are really working in rubbish parts of the city, in storefront areas, doing stuff where the world will look at it and go, I mean, hey, if this was an important church, you'd have a big million dollar cathedral. How are they working on a little storefront like that? They, they consider it rubbish. It's right there where God can do his best work in rebuilding. And it just shows how God's ways are not our ways. And the enemy doesn't understand it. But do we? Do we, the servants, understand that God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not his, our thoughts. So we need to get on board with what he's, what he's doing. And the Samballots and the Samaritans and the Ammonites will look at us completely confused. This is completely opposite how they would do it. I must admit, I struggle with this too. I mean, the Lord is able to work with what appears to be uh, weak people, uh, feeble-minded people, uh, 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 back uh, little tiny storefront places, like my, my brother up there in Governor New York, he's got this little storefront place, and across the street there are big cathedrals and basilicas, and he goes out on the street, and he's doing more for God than all those big churches around him, and yet people just can't see it. How many people be afraid to even walk into a building like that that is a true church? An assembly of believers gathered together in the name and the word of Jesus Christ versus some dead uh, sepulcher over there that looks good on the outside but's full of death and dead men's bones on the insides. And so, so you see the, the, um, the, the rhetoric that they use in their hatred, doubting the fitness of the workers, the number of the workers, how few there are, the faith of the workers, the fervency, and then the actual materials and fabric that they use. Now, going on to verse 3. Now, Tobiah the Ammonite was by him. In other words, Samballot was the spokesman, and Tobiah is the, the yes man, but willing to go along. And, and he said, well, even that which they build, if a fox go up, he'll, he'll break down their stone wall. And what's happening is there are people agreeing and consenting and reinforcing the hatred and the contempt. The, there's, the enemy has 
many reinforcing and siding with him. There are multitudes, multitudes holding their hand together in wickedness. It's, it seems to be so easy. I, I, it's a, a thought of the natural man. It, it just struck me this week, and I know this seems like a side uh, thought, but, but consider this. I was thinking about how the natural man is more willing to align with evil than with truth. And I was the prime example. Now, in my 20s, I had heard of two books which I never bothered to read because I was so busy doing other things. One book was the Bible. That's truth. The other book was The Origin of the Species, written by Charles Darwin. I never read it. I never examined either book. I was too busy doing what I had to do to get through life to make a living for my family. I had heard about both books, and I guess I had to make a decision to believe one or the other, and guess which one I believed? The wrong book. How easy the fallen nature and the sinful heart aligns with evil without ever examining the evidence. There, there, there were people talking bad about the Bible. There were people talking bad about Darwin. There were people talking good about the Bible. There were people talking good about Darwin. I easily could have picked a side and without examining the evidence, I just fell to the wrong side. And I want to show you the reinforcement of contempt for God's work is easy for the natural man. And the, and the crowds begin to build and transgression multiplies. When children are left to themselves, the, the mother is brought to shame because the next verse's transgression begins to multiply. You leave a child to himself, the foolishness builds up, uh, numbers of them build up, transgression increases, and there's a big crowd on the wrong side. And that's what's happening here. There's a crowd on the wrong side against God's work. And quickly, there's Sanballat and Tobiah and then Geshem and then this guy and that guy. And there's a whole bunch of people aligned against the work of God. And we see this all the time. We're fighting masses and crowds as we're going uphill toward the Lord. And we see the reinforcement. We, we see there's a, not only an enemy in the reinforcement, there's an environment in the reinforcement. Uh, verse 3, Tobiah the Ammonite was right next to him and he begins to mock to and, and uh, he exaggerates. If a fox go up, he'll break down that stone wall. I mean, the truth of the matter is no fox broke any part of that wall that they built. They built a strong, powerful, fortified wall. But, but these liars, these opposers are great at exaggerating their side of a story and minimizing God's side of a story. And that's what you find are the exaggerated lies. Whenever the enemy wants to push something, he uses exaggeration. I'm thinking back when I was a little boy and they were trying to push the killing of babies. And they exaggerated the number of uh, back alley abortions that went on. And it turns out there was only about three that had happened that entire year. But they exaggerated it to thousands. They're always exaggerating their numbers when they're lying, trying to get people to go with them. Today they exaggerate the, the, the fear, well, the goofy fear of, let's say, environmentalism and, and global warming, how the seas are going to rise and wash away the cities. I mean, they just exaggerate all the time, and exaggeration is what they do. And we see the exaggeration in their contempt. Now, how are God's people going to respond to this? Because, I mean, we've seen this, all this contempt. There's, there's opposition. They're, they're rapid. They're rage. They've got their friends. They're reinforced. There's all kinds of... How, how do you respond to this? Well, the response is, is this. Here's how we're to respond. Verse 4. Hear, O our God, for we are despised, and turn their reproach upon their own head, and give them for a prey in the land of captivity, and cover not their iniquity, and let not their sin be blotted out from before thee, for they have provoked thee to anger before the builders. The reaction is number one, prayer. Now, in modern Christianity, they couldn't handle a prayer like this. This is a prayer of imp we're praying for our enemies to meet God's wrath and meet his judgment. 
because they're behaving in a way that they need to be judged. We're not the judge. God is the judge. So we're praying God look upon their work and judge it accordingly. Bring your strength and your judgment against them. Vengeance is thine, Lord. So expose what they're doing, what they're doing privately, what they're doing behind closed doors. Jesus is saying, nothing you do in, in private, it'll be exposed one day. Your sin will find you out. Well, bring it out now. So those who are in the valley of decision and trying to decide where we're going to go, these scorners that are leading the fight are looking to gain crowds to themselves. If we could just expose them, Lord, if you could expose them for what they're doing, then those who are simple will beware and they'll join you, Lord, and not them. And so prayer needs to be done for evil leaders like that, that they will be exposed, that God will let their sin be found out, that will go before others right now, so it will make others be, beware. It's a good prayer. Turn their reproach on their own head. That's the prayer. And um, what do we do after we pray? Verse 6, and so we built the wall. After we pray, we just get right back to, to perseverance, right back to performance of duty. You got to get up off your knees when you're done praying and then get walking and pick up your hands and get back to work, lifting up holy hands and getting back to the work of God. There has to be persistency. So we built the wall. Uh, I'm thinking, uh, go to Galatians chapter 6. The opposition, I mean, at first they mock us before we start. Then they try and they stand on our way once we do start. Then they try and gather an army together and get the government to get us uh, against us and, and put these restraining orders when we're doing our work and they think they're going to shut us down. How are we going to do? We're going to get back up. We're going to be persistent. We're not going to walk away. We're going to try and go right back downtown and we're going to preach again. We're going to track back there again. We're going to go right back there. Those people need the gospel and we're going to let some foolish government official keep some soul that needs the truth from hearing it. There's got to be a persistence to it. And I know it, it begins to wear you down, but Galatians 6 verse 9, let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. So as we therefore have opportunity, let us do good unto all men. And especially to them who are of the household of faith, let's build together. Let's work together. Let's not fight each other. Let's pray for the enemy uh, to, to, to have God's vengeance and let us fight the good fight of faith against him, not against one another. And we need to perform it. And so back to where we are in Nehemiah uh, chapter 4, it says, um, verse 6, so we built the wall and, and all the wall was joined together unto the half thereof, for the people had a mind to work. Um, in other words, what you got to do is you got to pay little mind to the opposition. Pay little mind to the contempt. Pay little mind to the gossiping going on there. Just, just let it fall off. Just The sayings you want to sink in your ears are God's words, not the words of the enemy. You let those fall right out. You know, somebody said this about you, Brother Mike. So what? Couldn't care less. I'm not interested. The Lord knows who I am. The Lord knows my character. The Lord knows the desires of my heart. Doesn't matter what they think. They're not going to judge me anyways in the end. So I'm not worried about what they think or what they say. I want to be persistent in keeping about God's work. Pay little of mind to the contempt. Concentrate on the business of God's work. Concentrate on construction. Your mind is to be set on God and His Word and His direction. He's our Savior. He's our Lord. He's our Master. Not these little guys making noise off to the side. We should hear one voice, and that's the Lord. So, so what we saw is first we saw the contempt in the opposition, but the next thing you're going to see is verse 7. When, when Now verse 6, the men keep going, so, so what's Sambalak going to do? Well, verse 7, it came to pass 
that when Sambalat and Tobiah and the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up and that the breaches began to be stopped, <laughs> then they were very wroth. And, and so it started with contempt, and now what's going to happen, verse 8, and they conspired, all of them together, to come and to fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. Now, there's a lot of, you know, Christians that waste a lot of time studying conspiracy theories, but they're the wrong conspiracy theories. There's a true conspiracy theory that's mentioned right here. It's not a conspiracy to bring down a president or to topple a government. The, the real conspiracy is to try and stop the work of God of trying to reach souls on this planet. That's the real conspiracy. That's where, I mean, God inspires people from above to do the right thing. The opposer, Satan, the adversary, conspires foolish minions and deceives them from beneath to try and stop the work of God, to come and to fight, it says verse 8, against Jerusalem and to hinder it, to come and fight against the church of Jesus Christ and to hinder it. That's the real conspiracy today. The other stuff is ancillary and, and periphery and it's leaves on the trees you don't need to worry about. The real conspiracy is the root of the matter and I don't need to know, all I need to know is the root of that tree is corrupt and one day God will chop it down and I want nothing to do with it. I don't want to eat its fruit. I don't want to look at it. I want to avoid it entirely and I want to stay with what God's doing. But I want to understand what a true conspiracy is. That's true conspiracy according to the Bible. And every time you look at it, it's a conspiracy against God his sovereignty, and his work of saving souls. That's true conspiracy in a Bible. And I don't, I don't follow the rest of the conspiracy theories. I don't care who brought the towers down. There's just a couple of buildings in New York City. But I care if somebody wants to take down the towers of truth, an old and a new testament. They want to take down buildings where, where people are gathered together in the name of Jesus Christ and rip up assemblies where, where families are trying to come together and guide their children in the truth and then help other families find the way and the truth and the life. That's the conspiracy I'm concerned about, not the other stuff. And so we see the conspiracy in all this thing, and it's opposition that grows. It's not just a few men anymore. Now it's, it's groups. The evil doesn't sit still. It begins to multiply. And we see them all gathering together. Uh, verse 7, uh, they were very wroth at this point. And again, it, again, it reveals the character. A lot of these men are reprobate. They've rejected God entirely. They're the scorners. They're the worst of the worst. It, they're not even worth our time, I believe, praying for their salvation or witnessing to. They're, they're beyond salvation. I believe we have other souls that we can work at, and there are lots of, other, of those other souls, and we want to get them before they are following these men or these evil men who are waxing worse and worse, deceiving people. And, of course, themselves being deceived by the devil who's conspiring in them. And that's what we need to work out. Uh, verse 8, they, they, the, um, they conspired all of them to come together and fight against Jerusalem. They get together to attack God's word and God's work. Verse 11, they um, say, Our adversary said, They shall not know, neither see, till we come in the midst among them and slay them, and cause the work to cease. I mean, in some, the way they work best is in secret. The, 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 the first detail here is the secrecy. Uh, go, for example, to um, Psalm 64. Psalm 64. You know, with the Bible, we begin to understand and know these people and we don't want to know them personally, relationally, but we want to understand how it is they work. Psalm 64. David went through this and wrote some instruction for us. And here it is hundreds of years later, and Nehemiah is going through it. And centuries later, Jesus would go through it. And today we're going through it. 64. 
uh, Psalm. Hear my uh, voice, O God, in my prayer. Preserve my life from fear of the enemy. Hide me from the secret counsel of the wicked, from the insurrection. They're rising up against God. Of the workers of iniquity. You know what God thinks of those workers of iniquity? If you're still in the Psalms and you back up to Psalm 5. I just want to show you what God thinks of these workers of iniquity. Psalm 5, look at verse 5. This is uh, David again praying to the Lord. Psalm 5, verse 5. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Then he makes this statement about his father in heaven. Thou, that's his father, that's the Lord of verse 3, of verse 1, hatest all workers of iniquity. Workers of iniquity are, are a special class of sinners. I mean, they're, they're, they're sinners to the nth degree. These are sinners of sinners. These are championship uh, heavyweight sinners. They're not just the average person who's struggling with alcohol addiction or, or, or uh, you know, watching pornography or struggling with things like that. These are workers of iniquity that are conspiring against the work of God who are trying to stumble other people. This is, this is the worst form of scorning. These are people who de Jesus looked at and said, you're of your father, the devil. They're not just Adam isn't their father anymore because the sins of Adam are basic sins. And you want to steal a little bit. You, you, you want to commit a little adultery. You want to have a little fist to cuffs with someone, get angry. Those are the sins of Adam. These are the workers of iniquity. These are the ones in Psalm 64, the workers of iniquity, uh, verse 3, who wet their tongue like a sword and they bend their bows to shoot their arrows. What are their arrows? Even bitter words. You know, salvation comes by words. Jesus said, my words are spirit and they are life. I mean, the ear gate is the way that God wants to come in. And these come in with bitter words. Words that poison hearts and souls and consciences and wills to the point where one day they find themselves standing in the judgment of God and being cast into a lake of fire. And the way they do it is by trying to stop the workers of the Lord from getting the message out so they can blind others from ever hearing the truth. These are the workers of iniquity in Psalm 64. It says in verse uh, 4, that they may shoot in secret at the perfect. They get together and they write these articles about the perfect Son of God, Jesus Christ. And they tell lies about God's Son. And they present them as scholarly research. So people who don't know any better have never examined a Bible read this and go, oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know Jesus had relationships and had kids. I didn't know these. Whether, whether they, that, that's what this researcher said. And they, they do in secret. They come up with the, they, they shoot in secret at the perfect Bible. The Word of God with a capital W, Jesus, and the Word of God with a little w, the Bible. Verse 5, they encourage themselves in an evil matter. They commune of laying snares privily. The, the parents went and they said, you, you brought our children into this thing and, and we, didn't, we couldn't even opt them out. They said, we wrote the policy that way, that we're not going to let you know when we're doing it and you can't opt out. And that policy is going forth in California and it'll start rolling across the liberal states one by one. Just like that, that was, it, was it policy 89, plan 89, law 89, the one that passed in, in, Cal, in uh, Canada three weeks ago? And that new thing that just passed in Canada, the legislature passed it 63 to 26, and the, and the president cited it in Canada, and it, and it says this, that if your child comes home in Canada and thinks they want to change their sex, and you try and talk them out of it, the child is removed from your house. We take the child. And not only that, are you not allowed to talk against the child, but you now have to pay for everything that child wants to have their sex changed. And that's law in Canada. I mean, who did that? Well, they did this communing of laying these snares privily. Who's going to see them? Who saw them when they were writing this stuff as they did it behind closed doors? 
they, verse 6, they search out iniquities and they accomplish a diligent search for evil, how to stumble people, how to trap people, how to keep them from God and from His Word and from true worship. The inward thought of every one of them and the heart is deep. I try to tell you all these guys, times, these people that do this stuff, these, these leaders in high places, there's no accident. Oh, they know what they're doing. They know what they're doing. Now, thankfully, verse 7, God shall shoot at them with an arrow. Suddenly they'll be wounded. You can read the rest of that psalm. But that's the way it works. I mean, the secrecy of the plans. Going back to where we are in uh, Nehemiah 4. But verse uh, 11, that, that secrecy in the plans. And not only this, in, in verse 11, he says, uh, the adversary said, they shall not know, neither see, we're doing this uh, privately, secretly, they'll never know until we ambush them, until we come in the midst among them. You know what they want to do? They want to they sneak in. They want to work their way in. They have plants that come in and say, yeah, we want to build with you. We're, we, we believe like you do. Now, our God is your God, your God is our God. And they, they send them in like, like, like the Jesuits. I mean, in duplicity, with subtlety, trying to work their way in. There was a, a, a Jesuit priest that, that went into a, a Bible Baptist seminary and went all the way through and got the ordained as a Bible Baptist and then started a church. And he did this for a while so that he could come out and then renounce the Bible and renounce Christianity and go back home to Holy Mother Roman, Mother Church, Roman Catholic Church which is Revelation 17, the mother of harlots. And by doing that, he, he was on all kinds of TV programs and radio programs and everybody interviewing him all over the place by this duplicity. And that's the way they work. And, uh, and you know, ultimately they want to do, not only that, it says, we'll come in, uh, verse 11, in the midst and slay them. And ultimately, these leaders, these governmental leaders, when they have enough people behind them, they'll martyr Christians. They'll kill Christians. And this has gone on for centuries. We're blessed right now that it hasn't got to the point where we're shedding blood for our faith. But you give them time. You give these Ammonites and Tobiah and these Geshems enough power and enough strength and enough time and it'll get to the point where it will be Penalty worthy of death. We, we've just brought the death penalty back for the worst type of hate crime, which is going to be the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that'll be the only thing worthy of the death penalty. And they'll slay them. And that's what they are. And they just got, want you to see the father, your father, the devil is a liar from the beginning and he's a murderer too. And so we see the... Uh, the, the method of the type of the conspiracy that they have, that, that conspiracy is uh, it's secret, it has its plans, it has its sneaking in, and then ultimately the slaying. And why do they want to do it? End of verse 11. So the work ceases. We've got to stop that gospel. The only hope for mankind is God's worship and God's truth, and we've got to stop it. And here they are doing it back in the time of Jerusalem and the building of the wall. And today we see the same thing. And very soon the Antichrist will have that control. And there will be no Bible left. And they'll be doing this. That's okay. The Lord's going to bring judgment. So, so now, how do we counter this? I mean, we, we've seen the, the contempt. We've seen the conspiracy. How do we counter all this? Well, uh, verse 9. Nevertheless, we made our prayer unto our God. The first thing we've got to do is we've got to pray. We've got to continue to pray. We're in a spiritual battle. Part of the weapons of our warfare are prayer. Staying on our knees and asking God to help. So, so you know, before we went out today, Pastor Al and I, we prayed. After we went out, Pastor Al and I, we prayed. Before we go see these city attorneys, Pastor and I go, we're going to pray. We have our prayer meetings on Thursday night. We have to pray so that we can stand for the gospel and God can begin to go forward with His Spirit and push back the enemy and begin to part them like He parted the Red Sea to give us a way to go forth. We've got to pray. And I, and I wish more people would make our prayer meetings, but I'm thankful for everyone that made it tonight. And, and that's why we get together and we pray. And we pray individually and we pray collectively because we're rebuilding together. 
And so prayer is important. The next thing they had to do, uh, verse 13. Uh, Therefore set I in the lower places behind the wall, and on the higher places even I set the people after their families with their swords and, and their spears. And I looked, and I rose up, and said to the nobles, and to the rulers, and to the rest of the people, Be ye not afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible. And fight for your brethren, and your sons, and your daughters, and your wives, and your houses. We've got to uh, make our supplication. We've got to uh, stay together. We've got to set up the watch, which is what we're doing is we're getting people in various places watching on the higher place you can watch. We need some lookouts that can see things. Uh, one goes forward and sees the opposition and come back and tells. And he, he says, you know what I've heard today? I've heard that they're doing this. And then we get together and we pray about it and we get ready and we're not afraid of them. We remember the Lord. He's great and terrible. And we continue the fight. We speak up in in to each other. We encourage one another. We, we tell them, look, God is good. We don't have to be afraid. Fear not them which kill the body, but fear him which is able to kill the soul, destroy both the soul and the body in, in hell, and fight for your brethren. Hey, the church is worth fighting for. Hey, families are worth fighting for. Where are some men that are willing to take a stand anymore? We're going to throw our children to the wolves. We're going to throw our churches to the wolves. We've got to be willing to fight the, the, the government, the, the school, the, the media, the newspapers, the society in general is attacking the work of God. They're attacking the family. Somebody's got to stand and we've got to fight. Now our fight is spiritual. It's not carnal. Our weapons are not carnal, they're spiritual. We've got to cast down the imaginations. First, the ones in our very minds that would make us think we can't win this battle. We can win this battle. We're going to win this battle. Thanks be to God which giveth us the victory. We've read the end of the book. We know that we win. And we know it's the one that's greater that's in us is greater than, than the oppositions and what's in the world out there. But we've got to encourage each other and speak and provoke one another to these good works. This is the fight that we have to do. Uh, scripture does not support any form of pacifism. Go to uh, Exodus chapter 15. Look at verse 3. Exodus 15, verse 3. Exodus 15. The Lord is a man of war. And he's calling men to the fight. As a matter of fact, if I back up a few pages to Exodus chapter 12, verse 51. It says, it came to pass the selfsame day the Lord did bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their armies. He's assembling a military unit to fight the forces of evil that are out there. The darkness of this world. Somebody's got to fight it with the light of the gospel and the light of truth. And someone's got to take a stand. And we need some men. It, it breaks my heart with this uh, uh, effeminate American man today. You get him saved and you can't really... You can make an American into a Christian, but you can't seem to make an American Christian into a man. I don't know why that is. Probably the best one we'll get are guys that played on sports teams. They know how to fight. Guys like that, you can get them saved. You can make fighters out of them. But these other guys have been watching movies their whole life and living vicariously and don't know how to do anything. They don't know how to stand and to fight. And we need some armies today of men that are willing to stand. Why? Because it's the, the home that we're fighting for. It's the family of God that we're fighting for. It's the truth that we're fighting for. It's worth fighting for. Going back to Nehemiah chapter 4. You know, even even from a civil standpoint, you know, the, the confusion. God would say, when a man commits murder, then he should shed his blood. Because if you don't slay and take a murderer out, who knows how many other people he'll kill. 
He's going to get some innocent child someday, some innocent old lady one day, some innocent uh, a woman coming home from work. I mean, he, this man is a menace to society. God gave government for the purpose of doing this. They've abdicated their responsibility. Okay, fine. But if there are spiritual murders out there, we've got to stand against them. We've got to call them out. We've got to point them out. And we've got to speak against the evil words that they've come up with with the truth. And our truth will overcome it. And we've got to fight. Go back to where we are and, and, and look at verse 15. So, so after encouraging themselves, uh, be not afraid, uh, fight for your brethren, fight for your wives, fight for your daughters, fight for your sons. Amen. Hey, are there some Christian men get on their knees and pray for their, their children, for their salvation, willing to fight against the, the enemy wants to steal those kids, you know. We've got to fight against the adversary. Verse 15, it came to pass when our enemies heard that it was known to us and God had brought their counsel to naught. Amen. We returned all of us to the wall, every man to his work. It came to pass from that time forth that the half of my servants wrought in the work and the other half, they held both spears, the shields and the bows and the habergeons and the rulers were behind all the house of Judah. Uh, here's the portrait today. The, the ones rotting in the work would be the ones witnessing. And the ones behind them are the ones that are lifting them up in prayer. And God is using His spears from the heavens to, to make way for those out there uh, that are witnessing. God is putting His shield of faith around those men that are on the front lines. God is putting His, his habergeons and protection armor around these men so they can take the fiery darts of the wicked when they're out there on the front lines. We need the witness men and we need the prayer men. Not everybody is called to go downtown to witness. I understand that. But the ones that aren't called to go downtown to witness, if God hasn't put that in your heart, may he put on your heart to pray for those that are down there. And so it's, it's an even balance. And those that are staying by the stuff and the Bibles and the, and the altars and praying and those that are out there on the front lines. And the work is being divided up, but it has to be done. And that's the way we do it together. Verse 17, and they builded on the wall and they bear the burdens. Those that laid it, every one with one of his hands wrought it in the work and the other held a weapon for the builders. Everyone had his sword girded by his side and so builded. The only hope we have to build right is with the sword of the spirit. We can't build this work without God's word. It is absolutely essential to build families, lives, the church, if you ever were a nation, but I don't think we're going to get a nation at this point, with the Word of God, the prayer tonight for wisdom for the church. You know what they need? They need the sword of the Spirit. They need the one that God fashioned, the glistening sword of the Lord that has fire. It's like a hammer. It's two-edged. It pierces to the dividing of the sun, uh, asunder of the soul and the Spirit, not some plastic sword that the devil's put in there that can't do anything. He laughs at it because he made it in the first place, and it can't hurt him, and he mocks at it when it comes his way. No, we need the sword of the Spirit. We need the Bible. Verse 19, I said to the nobles and to the rulers and, and to the rest of the people, the work is great. This is a great work. The greatest work you can do is working with God toward the salvation of souls and changing the eternity of people that will only live a hand breadth of a span of life in the face of eternity it's a great work, and it's large. It extends all over the world. Here in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. It's a great work, and it's large. And we're separated upon the wall. We're one far from another. And here we are doing our work here, and Brother Marco's doing his work in South America, and Brother Work is doing his, Rosard's doing his work over in Africa, and we're doing it all together. But we're doing it for the glory of God, in the power of God, and it's a great work. We're fighting for our brethren, our sons, our daughters, our families. This is a great work. Uh, uh, verse 20, In what place, therefore, ye hear the sound of the trumpet, resort ye thither unto us, for our God shall fight for us and we sound the trumpet of the Lord 
and the gospel of Jesus Christ and the music rings to the hallelujah chorus and we get excited like we just sang a few minutes ago with that uh, 290 hymn what's the name of that uh, Christ returneth and and we're excited for the great work that we're doing uh, uh, verse 21 so we labored in the work yes it's labor it's a labor of love it's not coasting in an easy chair to build the wall to build the wall of truth to place it around your mind, to place it around your heart, to place it around your family and your home, to place it around your church, to place it around your community. It's a great work. And it's going to require labor. I'm sorry. You got to make a schedule. You got to have a day planner. You got to you got to set the time aside. This is when I'm going to read. This is when I'm going to pray. This is when I'm going to go out. I'm going to meet with other brothers. This is when we're going to have our meetings together. We're going to work together. There's labor involved in it. And we labored at verse 21 and half of them held the spears from the rising of the morning till the stars appeared. The labor can be done anytime, day or night. We can be praying. We can rise at midnight to give God thanks for the work he's doing. Verse 22, likewise at the same time I said to the people, let everyone with his servant lodge within Jerusalem that in the night they may be a guard to us and labor on the day. Now what, back then historically what he found is uh, some of the laborers were coming into the city and then they'd go back home and they would try and take them as they were walking on those pathways. And the safest thing was to stay together. You know, the safest thing to stay as a Christian is to stay together. When we go walking out alone, that's when the enemy's going to get one of us. That's when a sheep wanders out alone. We need to stay together in Jerusalem. We need to stay in our Bible. We need to stay in the local assembly God's put us into. Uh, th this will be the guard to us. This will help us labor during the day. Verse 23, so neither I, nor my brethren, nor my servants, nor the men of the God which followed, none of us put off our clothes, saving that everyone put them off for the washing. And, and we go about our business, and the only time we stop is when we're confessing. And we're cleansing ourselves spiritually to go back to the work. Just like Jesus said, now let me wash your feet. Let me clean you up. I know you've been doing a lot of work. I know it's been a hard labor. I know you've faced opposition. You, you've faced adversity. You've faced insult. I know it's begun to upset your mind and your heart. And maybe a little of the mud is sticking. Let me clean this off so you can go back and be a vessel fit for mercy. Clean, fit for the master's use. And that's how rebuilding is done. And we overcome opposition doing it God's way. There's no other way. There's no other way. I think we're out of time. Any thoughts, comments, questions? Amen. Let's pray. 